Okay, everyone, we're going to get started with our March 5th, 2024 primary election candidate forum. Uh, before we get started, though, today we are fortunate because we're going to be joined by the Scouts, Troop 436, and Noah, who's going to be leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So I would like to welcome the Scouts. Color guard attention, audience attention. Color guard advance. Color guard halt. Color guard prepare to post the colors. Color guard post the colors. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Color Guard salute. Two. Color Guard regroup. Color Guard advance. Color guard at ease, audience at ease. Once again, I'd like to thank the Scouts, True 436, and Noah for leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Can we please give them a round of applause? So now we can go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, my name is Francisco Diaz. I'm the County Clerk Recorder Registrar of Voters for the County of San Benito. And on behalf of the Elections Department, I wanna thank you for attending the March 5th, 2024 Presidential Primary Candidate Forum. The purpose of the Candidate Forum is to provide you with, sp with the nonpartisan space for incumbents, candidates, or members of the public to learn about the legal requirements for running for office. Whether for local, state, or federal election, this forum will provide you with the necessary steps to become a qualified candidate. This forum will cover qualifications, filing deadlines, filing fees, financial disclosures, candidate statements, and recommended best practices. The forum, however, will not provide you with fundraising best practices, guidelines on obtaining endorsements, or anything else that may be deemed political. Furthermore, in an effort to provide you with the most up-to-date information, the Elections Department has partnered with the Geographical Information System Department, more commonly referred to as GIS, Benito Link, Integrated Waste Management Department, known as IWM, and the Fair Political Practices Commission, the FPPC, on this candidate forum. Finally, thanks to Community Media Partnership, CMAP, this forum will be recorded and it will be made available to the public on our election website, YouTube, and other social media platforms. Please be respectful to the presenters and attendees, and do not hesitate to ask questions about the information that's being provided. If you, have, you would like to discuss a subject that's not on today's presentation, please schedule an appointment with the Elections Department or talk to any of our elections officials that are here today. In addition, I would like to remind you of a few housekeeping rules. We do have a restroom that's located outside. In addition, there are handouts, pens and paper and other uh, informational material behind this, uh, for, uh, behind the room. And of course, this is a public event, so it, it is completely okay to take pictures or video if you wish to do so. Now, we can go ahead and get started. First, I would like to invite Ana de Castro de Maquis, our Chief Deputy County Clerk Recorder of Elections, who is the person responsible for coordinating this event, but most importantly, among her other responsibilities, she's also the manager of the elections department. So Ana, can you please come forward? Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. First and foremost, I'd like to bring up my team, Cheyenne Wiles, our staff analyst, and Michael Parsons, if you could both um, join me. So both of these are 
really are experts or are those that focus on the elections department and your main contacts when uh, filing all of your requirements. So our office is located at 440 Fifth Street in room 205. We have an open door policy. You're always welcome to join us. Please visit us or give us a phone call at 831-636-4016 or send us an email. We are have open communication with everyone and we welcome questions, comments, and concerns. All right, so I was, was mentioned, the offices up for this election for March 5th, 2024 are the following. We have presidential and state legislative offices, county offices, and central county central committee offices. These are the ones that are going to be up for the primary election on March 5th, 2024. And for this presentation, that is what we are covering. Okay, so when to file. Um, did it, We do have handouts. Where Was everyone able to pick up this handout? If not, we can have someone bring that handout to you. Okay, we have a few. We'll give it a few seconds. So the first page does tell you the contest up for this election. And if you switch to the back of this page, you have our summary filing calendar for candidates. So this is really your main resource as to when things will be due for candidates. So you can see all of the documents that are, are going to be due and when it applies and to what candidate it applies and the filing period it applies to. Some of these can be done at the convenience of your home without having to come to our office, but most of these you will have to come into our office and see one of us. Okay, and we will be covering the majority of these documents throughout this presentation. Okay. The very first thing on here is the online candidate pre-registration. The online candidate pre-registration is for candidates that would like to receive their nomination paperwork, except for the declaration of candidacy, via email or US uh, postal mail. We're open to sending that to you in advance so that you're able to complete it without any rush at the convenience of your home. And this paperwork will take about 20 to 30 minutes to complete. And really it's um, making sure that you have plenty of time, but at the end of the day, um, before you declare your, uh, do the declaration of candidacy, you will need to come in and see us because all documents, all paperwork by the candidate must be completed, signed, and returned with the original wet signatures to our office. And this is available from beginning September 1st to December 8th. Okay, and do I have any questions so far? Okay. All right. And then now I'll hand it over to Michael Parsons. So let me start by saying the next few slides are in chronological order. So as things come available, uh, and not all apply to all offices. So I'll try to hit that and tell you. First thing is signatures in lieu of filing fee. All offices on the March uh, uh, ballot, except for county central committees, have a filing fee. It, 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 there's a mathematical formula. It's on this page. It's on the third page of this handout. This is estimated and will be updated on October 23rd once we have a final count of registration uh, to, to, to help do the math. <coughs> Signatures in lieu of filing fee are a way of, one, gathering your nomination signatures ahead of time. You have a minimum of 20 signatures, a little more if you're running for Congress. Um, but then, more importantly, is a way of offsetting the filing fee cost. Uh, there's a value assigned to every signature, so for every valid signature, you deduct that much, and you won't, you'll, be, you'll be allowed to pay less for the filing fee. That opens on September 14th, and it goes until November 8th. Oops, sorry. The next event on October 30th is for judicial candidates only. 
judicial candidates must file in our office a declaration of intention. It's a simple form, but it is a requirement. The difference here with every other candidate is you must pay your filing fee at that time. The deadline for this is also the deadline for the signatures in lieu. So get them in and we can calculate your filing fee hopefully for you by that date. So you, the judicial candidates must be a little ahead of time and be done and, and, and basically make themselves known. If you're running for central committee, there are no, there is no filing fee, but there is nomination signature requirements. You must have between 20 and 40 valid signatures from members of your party and from the supervisorial district for which you are running. You must come to our office, you must file the declaration of candidacy. At that point, we will give you a nomination petition. At that point, you go out and get your signatures and you have until December 8th to return and finish that process. For all other candidates, the declaration of candidacy and nomination period is from November 13th to December 8th. <coughs> you must, before we can give you anything, pay your filing fee. Judicial's already done that. We have a week, we will have your signatures in lieu calculated, we will know what your filing fee is, and we will, and we will ask you to pay that. At that point, we'll give you a declaration of candidacy, a ballot designation worksheet, some other paperwork, and if you did not receive the minimum 20 to 40 signatures, a nomination, new petition for nomination. You file all the paperwork, you finish all the paperwork, you do a candidate statement if you wish to have one. Cheyenne will talk about that next. Um, but if you don't have the nomination signatures ahead of time, you will have to do that. Filing fees are non-refundable. So, so if you, the reason why the, the signatures in lieu are a good thing, get them done, you have all your signatures, you don't have to worry about not qualifying. And uh, I, I kind of went a little, I, I skipped to the next one fast. Did anyone have any questions? <laughs> All right. Ms. Cheyenne. Thank you, Mike. Okay, so candidate statements. They are optional. It is not required to submit a candidate statement. Candidate statements typically consist of education and qualifications for the contest. Candidate statement must be filed at the time of completing the declaration of candidacy, which is during the nomination period. U.S. Senate candidates, candidates can purchase 250 word statement to be placed in the state voter guide. Now, U.S. Congress, state Senate, and state assembly candidates can purchase a 250 word statement to be uh, placed in the county voter guide. All local candidates can purchase a 200 word statement to be placed in the county voter guide as well. Candidates can choose to have their statement posted online only for a reduced fee. Candidates running for a contest that crosses multiple counties, for example, San Benito and Santa Clara County, you must file in the uh, appropriate county's office. All filed statements may be withdrawn on December 11, 2023 if the candidate chooses to no longer have a statement. Okay, candidate statement fees. So these are estimated costs, they are subject to change. For all local candidates, a 200 word statement costs $250 plus five cents per voter in the district, which is why it's subject to change because we have the report of registration October 23rd, 2023. For US Congress, State Senate, and State Assembly candidates, they can submit a 250 word statement that costs $400 plus five cents 
per voter in the district. Now, candidates have the option to have their statement be posted online, like I already previously mentioned, for $150. And once again, we will not have these numbers available until October 23rd for the um, correct candidate statement fee. Any questions so far? Yes. Correct. So during nomination period, uh, November 13th to December 8th is when the candidate statement needs to be filed. When you're doing the declaration of candidacy, you're paying your filing fee, all that good stuff is when the candidate statement needs to be filed. And it's an no. Any other questions? Okay, we will move on. So candidate statement layout. I know it's kind of a wordy slide. Um, so we have all candidate statements will be printed as submitted. I want to emphasize on that. So for example, if there's a spelling error or punctuation misplaced, the elections department will not fix that. So please, please, please triple, quadruple check your candidate statement. Make sure that all the words are spelled right. When you do come in with us to file a candidate statement, we will have you reread it and double check again. Um, but I just do want to emphasize that even with spacing, all that. Um, the candidate can choose if they'd like to include their age or occupation. It is not a requirement. Um, so we have, oh, it looks so blurry. I am sorry about that. Um, but we have, this is what it would look like, kind of. It's really blurry. Don't know why it's like that. Um, it's formatted differently. So you are going to be submitting it as a Word document. So we have to fit it in our smaller book. So it gets significantly smaller. However, we do still leave it. So if you submitted a big chunk of paragraph, that's how it's going to be. We're not going to split it up into, um, you know, different sentences or anything like that. Um, back to the occupation field. So um, it is optional um, the occupation field does not have to match the ballot designation which is what is below the candidate's name on the ballot uh, the same laws and regulations do not apply for the occupation and the ballot designation candidate statements should not include any party affiliation or statements referring to any other candidates now the word count is where it can get kind of tricky each word is counted as one word. However, there are exceptions. For example, San Benito County or County of San Benito, that's considered one word. So when we release the candidate handbook, it'll be on page 40 and 41. So please refer to that as you're writing your candidate statement. Um, so that way you know exactly how many words you are at. And at no additional cost, all candidate statements will be printed in English and Spanish for our county voter information guide because we are required. Any other questions? No? Okay. So, moving on. If the incumbent does not file during the regular nomination period, it gets extended from December 11th to December 13th, 2023. Anyone can file during this period except for the incumbent. Now for judicial offices, if the incumbent does not file their declaration of intention by December 8th, 2023, the filing period will be extended for five calendar days. Any questions? No? Okay, I will pass it back on to Anna. Right, so let's talk about political signs. So the very first day that political signs can be posted is December 8th, 2023. And all campaign signs must be removed 10 days after the election. And then according to Caltrans, temporary political signs must meet the following criteria. The two that were listed previously and a, a couple others. One being they must no long, be no larger than 32 square feet and they cannot be um, 
in the right of way of any uh, drivers. So that means that they can't be too close to the edge when people are driving and they need to you know, not be obscuring any vision from um, any of the drivers um, on the road. And in addition to that, you must file a statement of responsibility um, that certifies who is responsible for removing the signs. Um, and this statement of responsibility form will be included in the nomination paperwork that we give to you at the beginning when we talked about pre-registration. So all of the information will be available to you so that you're able to follow all of the campaign sign rules. Okay. Now part two, we wanna encourage you, um, we know that there is a lot of different rules and regulations that need to be followed with political signs. So we wanna encourage you to go to the FEPC's campaign advertising requirements and restrictions to view their charts because those charts are based on the different types of advertisements and who pays for them. So these charts will be your, really your guide as to what needs to be on the political sign. And we did have the link um, here available. Um, this PowerPoint will be available um, at the end uh, so that you can all click through it and see and repeat this information. Do we have any questions about political science? Does, yes. Does the county have any map of what is public right of way versus private? Is that a suspected we have as well as the Yes, so we do have, uh, we do know that there's an ordinance and it's potentially gonna be um, changed or modified. So at the moment we, uh, that's all we have. We know that it's gonna be changed. And once we know that information, we will post about it. We will be posting the information that becomes available to the elections department. Any other questions on political science? Okay. All right, so on behalf of the elections department, I wanna thank you. Our presentation will be available online. All of this will be clickable. And as was mentioned previously and multiple times throughout the presentation, we will have a candidate handbook. At the moment, it's not posted because a report of registration isn't due to the Secretary of State until October 22nd. Therefore, our numbers will be final and complete by October 23rd, 2023. Once that is complete, you it will be all over our social media, all over our website, and we will make sure that those that are interested, that have either emailed us or that are coming into our office, know the most and latest information uh, as to what our final numbers are. Okay. Any last questions that I can take or clarify? Yes, Elia. Yes, that's correct. And yeah, yeah, definitely. Is it okay if I summarize, Elia? So really the question is, uh, if you run unopposed, if you're able to remove your candidate statement that you have already paid for and submitted to the elections department. So the answer is yes. You're able to do that on the following Monday. So I would be, I actually personally contact all of the candidates and ask, are you going to leave your candidate statement or withdraw it? And then at that point, if you don't answer me by email, I will call you and like ask you one more time, are you gonna keep it or withdraw it? Because we wanna make sure that you really wanna keep it or if you wanna withdraw it, you have that opportunity to do so. And that goes for those that are opposed or unopposed. I contact everyone. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much everyone. So I want to thank Anna and, of course, the Elections Department for their presentation. Now I want to invite Rene Archata, who's our GIS manager and who is responsible. Oh, do I have the wrong slide here? Sorry, yeah. OK, I'll keep, I'll keep talking. So I still want to invite Rene Archata, who's our GIS manager and who's responsible for creating, managing, analyzing, and mapping all types of data for the county of San Benito. Rene will provide this information of all types of services, there are additional services that are available to candidates and the public alike for information or, or for political purposes. And he's gonna talk more and speak more on this. So Rene.
Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, as Francisco said, I'm Renee Anchieta. Um, I do GIS for the county. Um, and so let's let's get started here. I just it's it's going to be a brief uh, presentation. Um, this is kind of a new format that I kind of did with this. And uh, first question I get every all the time is what is GIS? Um, uh, this definition, it, you know, it varies, but I, I kind of got this from um, from a website. It's a it's basically a system that creates, manages, analyzes maps and, and all types of data. Um, and with this data, you can connect it to maps and you can see, people can see um, patterns in the maps where things are, um, what things are like there, and you can drill down, uh, let me scroll down here. Um, for example, here uh, is kind of a, a graphic that shows uh, different layers overlaid over each other. And this is just, uh, you know, we, anything you can think of of the world we can uh, map. So this is parcels, zoning, topography, just everything. And basically with one click, you can click a button or click the map and um, it'll bring up information of, you know, what, what the population is there, what the address is there, land cover, you know, whatever. Any, any kind of information that's on the earth that we have mapped can be on there. Um, so it's, it's a really good tool, saves a lot of time. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's, it's visual res representation and shows uh, um, how citizens' choices can affect the future you know, of a city, state, or county. For example, um, anything like uh, uh, districts, boundary districts, and, um, and what streets they're on, and what, you know, stuff like that. Um, it's, uh, another thing is redistricting. It's huge in redistricting uh, whenever that comes around. Um, usually every 10 years, it's a big thing where you have to um, use GIS basically to uh, redistrict everything and uh, get population data, demographic data, and all that fun stuff. Um, another thing, and we'll, we'll, as I scroll down, uh, I'll show examples of this. Um, encourage voter participation is another huge one. Um, polling place locations where they can go to you know, drop off uh, ballots and stuff like that. And so here is a kind of an example that I have is, um, it's data viewed spatially. You can visualize patterns and trends um, and make decisions. So on the left, you have a table, um, which I get you know, fairly often, a table say of a thousand different uh, records or data points. And um, just looking at that table, you can't really, I mean, it'll take a while to kind of uh, uh, look at it and see what you have. But if you transform it into a map, then you can see patterns and, um, make decisions and, and, and see districts and, and um, the like. Uh, so it's really useful in that sense. Um, so I'm scrolling down here. This is a, uh, a polling place uh, locator that we had um, used for, I do believe it's the last election uh, and it's available to the public as well. So we have all the polling places listed on there and um, someone can go in and uh, enter their address. They enter this one uh, enter their address and then just click and it zooms in and um, we have a radius set of uh, uh, five miles so within that five miles it lists uh, voting centers and it gives you uh, the distance to the voting center is drop box and uh, a voter can come in and click and it'll show you where where um, the uh, the polling places are, and um, they can click on here and get that get information on various polling places and stuff like that. For example, hours and um, when they're open and, and all that stuff. So it's kind of a neat tool for uh, the public to use. And um, let's see here. Oh, I'm sorry. Um. Right, so, so on that, uh, I'm not sure. So right now it is reflecting. Oh yeah, sure. So so the question was, um, so we have, I'm trying to, to formulate this. I don't know if you want to help me on this, Mike, because I don't know that much about the. Uh, In 2021, we redrew the district lines. 
based on the 2020 census. However, if you were elected in 2020, you were elected to the old lines. In the case of District 1, that was a filling the remainder of a term, that Dom Zanger was elected to the old lines. Now there is some debate over whether, you know, what, where, where are the lines today? If you were elected to this, where is your line today? I believe you still have both. Correct. So the map, if you were to go to find my district, um, does have a layer you can say, do I want to see the 2010 or do I want to see the 20, or yeah, 2021. Uh, and so, yes, it it is complicated. Uh, after this election, there will be no more complication. Uh, everyone will be elected to the new lines. Um, but for the time being, there is a little bit of, however, if you are running for this office, you will use the 2020, this year, you will use the 2021 lines. Thank you, Mike. Good enough? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Mike. And yeah, and also just a, a little clarification that um, that district locator now it's also it says if say someone goes in there and, and um, it'll tell them use the 2010 boundaries if they're going to dist if they're looking at you know a, a specific district it'll it'll tell you to, to you know which boundaries to use a and that will be changed as Mike said after you know after the next election. Uh, any yeah any other questions on that? Um, and another thing we have here is a, uh, we have a, a kind, of, kind of a elections interactive map gallery um, and all the boundaries here, city council, uh, board of supervisors, you know, water districts are all in here. Um, uh, anybody can go in here and uh, view all that. Um, there's a, a, a lot of maps in there um, and it's, it's broken down in, within each district as well as um, just uh, overall um, districts as well. So. And, and all these links are also on the county website on our GIS um, department site. Um, so, um, other things we have um, is, for example, are these, um, uh, they're called story maps of uh, Board of Supervisor districts as well as uh, city council districts. And it's another thing public can go in, get all, get all kinds of information of what district you're in. Um, as well as who's, who's um, the supervisor or the city council member of that district. As well as um, for candidates, um, we can also get addresses within those districts. Um, and, and another thing we have is uh, the web GIS. This is um, also public. This has all, pretty much all the layers that we have. Well, most of the layers that aren't um, that are that are public facing is uh, we have on this site and um, this is another site that, that it is in our um, county county web page you can go in and click it and you can see you know anything you want roads and again you can drill down there's parcels in there and um, click a parcel get you know uh, information on, on that parcel um, as well as uh, whether you're in the floodplain and all that that stuff um, and to end, uh, this, is, this is just, and uh, these are just uh, links to our uh, um, county website, uh, our, our San Benito County ArcGIS online site, which has tons of maps, um, emergency maps, uh, anything you can think of. We have all that stuff in there. There's a lot of them. And again, the web GIS. And uh, that's all I have. Any questions? Great. <laughs> Thanks. So I want to thank Renee and just remind everyone that this is a service that the county has available for the public and ultimately whatever kind of data it's available is what you can have. So whether it be transportation, roads, school districts, cities, supervisors, landlines, electricity, any data that's available to him, he will be able to provide. So you can play with it yourself or you can also ask and request for a minimal fee, a copy of those data in terms of a map or any other data that he can export. So I highly encourage anybody that's interested to talk to Renee. But now I also want to bring up our friends at Benito Link. 
So we are very fortunate to be able to work with Benito Link. Benito Link's been a partner with the Elections Department. And whenever we send press releases, it is our main source of communication, as they do have uh, the polls of the public, and they're able to engage the community very well and have far-reaching uh, audience. So now I'm going to bring the editor of Benito Link forward, and he's going to give us a presentation. Hi everyone, uh, I'm the co-editor of Benito Link. I'll just give a brief summary of what Benito Link is, how it came about, and just some um, policies that we've put in place in regards to the elections process. Yes, Elliot. Noe Magaña. So Benito Link was created out of need. So in 2012, the Community Foundation held a listening session of almost a thousand people. Um, and among the, the, they were trying to figure out what the community thought they needed. Um, some of the stuff that came up was parks, and among that was local news. Um, so the Link thing was created um, through some grants and became ooh, nonprofit, I think, in 2015. Right now, Benito Link reaches, on average, about 60,000 unique readers a month. We rely on community support, grants, and sponsorships. As a nonprofit, we do not accept donations from anonymous sources, government agencies, political parties, elected or elected officials or candidates. And Benito Link does not endorse any candidates or measures. Benito Link's election coverage. And so the commonly do a, what we call a Q&A article and where we put all the candidates into an article and we ask them the same questions. I, um, it sort of as an introduction to the community in case they don't know who they are. Following that, we also do a candidate forum where we invite candidates to come to a forum. The last forum we had was at the Granada Theater. It was about 200 attendees where we had uh, candidates for Congress, candidates for Assembly, and candidates for the County of San Benito, City Council, San Juan Batista. In the past, we've also done candidates uh, for the Healthcare District and uh, Water Districts as well, we've covered it before. In non-election years, we do a town hall. It didn't happen. Actually, we we're planning one for this year a town hall where we invite newly elected officials to sort of report back to the community. And now we go sort of to the policies we've set in place. We allow two submissions to Benito Link from a candidate a month. The types of submissions that have been submitted before are platforms, endorsements, or to announce a candidacy. Submissions made by others, maybe not necessarily on behalf of the candidate, but endorsing a candidate, we will count as one for the candidate. So we would suggest the candidate to um, really be engaged and maybe um, communicate well with people or groups that um, they know are going to support them. Unpermitted submissions, anything that's really self-advertising or promotional in nature. Uh, if we receive those, I review them. I may contact the candidate or whoever submitted it and ask questions and um, suggest s some, if it needs only minor um, notes or changes, uh, we might suggest those. Otherwise, we will not publish it. And the why is because we, we believe that part, in general, these uh, community opinions columns public letters in Benito Link are a public service, so we want it to remain um, content worthy, or, or, or that is, um, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Um, a positive for the community to keep the dialogue uh, moving forward. And that's it, if I, you guys have any questions for me. Great, thank you.
Awesome. Thank you, Novi. We appreciate Benito Link for all your support and also for giving our local elections office good coverage and also for providing factual information. Now I'm going to invite Sofia Abonse. For, she's actually our elections associate, but she's going to be presenting on behalf of Integrated Waste Management, who unfortunately cannot be here. But before she begins, I want to express my gratitude for Integrated Waste Management for working with the elections office in its effort to become green certified, but in addition for helping our office implement sustainable practices that will help lower our carbon footprint. Now she's going to be presenting a presentation that's going to talk about how these two different departments and disciplines intertwine. Thank you, Francisco. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sofia Bonse, and I will be presenting on behalf of San Benito County's Integrated Waste Management, also referred to as IWM, on how to hold a sustainable campaign. Why is sustainable campaigning important? There are many benefits to leading a sustain sustainable campaign. It's a great way to lead by example, save money, and it is great with public relations. Next, I will be talking about a few tips to help your campaign be more eco-friendly and less wasteful. Consider emails and text over mailers. Emails and texts are a great way to reduce paper waste. As we all know, a lot of mail is sent out during elections and you don't want your information to be overlooked. Emails and texts are a great way to reach your constituents while at the same time reducing your cost. If you do decide to do mailers, consider using one of their recommended sustainable printing services, which will be mentioned further in the presentation, and choose recycled content paper. QR codes are another great way to reduce paper waste and cost from printing. They are an effective way to share various resources to a larger audience. Integrated Waste Management will be sharing the Sustainability Toolkit soon, which you can refer to for help with developing QR codes. Avoid single-use giveaways. If possible, try and opt for more sustainable and reusable options for giveaways. This is also a good promotional strategy as people will continue to utilize your branded reusable giveaways. Always try and avoid single-use products. Reuse your campaign signs. Make sure to avoid putting any specific dates or years on your signs so that you can utilize them again in the future, except when required by law. What is the California Green Business Network? The California Green Business Program is a network of local programs operated by counties and cities throughout California. Certified green businesses exceed all environmental regulations and implement specific practices to exceed, to reduce pol pollution, save water, conserve energy, and protect human health. We are excited to say that San Benito County Election Department has been certified as of this year. Here are a few regional green certified businesses that offer sustainab sustainable printing all except for Pajaro Valley Printing, although they do offer an array of sustainable printing options. So we have Truxis Enterprise located in Monterey, Printworks Solutions located in Salinas, Community Printers located in Santa Cruz, and Pajaro Valley located in Freedom, California. Save the date. The Elections Department is happy to announce that they will be partnering with Integrated Waste Management for a political sign disposal and recycling event, where candidates will be able to dispose of their signs at the elections office. This event will be held the week of March 11th through March 15th. As we approach the date, more information will be shared with the candidates. In addition to furthering our, our part, to further our partnering with IWM, there will be a sustainable toolkit put together that will allow more help and information with sending text, emails, reusable giveaways, QR codes, and much more. Be on the lookout for the sus sustainability toolkit, which will be available within the next month or so. If you have any further questions, please feel free to contact Integrated Waste Management. Thank you.
So thank you, Sophia. Now I want to invite Stephen Hernandez from the Political Reform Consultant of uh, FPPC, who's a political reform consultant, and he will be providing a presentation on how to get started as a candidate or a treasurer in compliance with the Fair Political Practice Commission regulations and laws. Now, Mr. Hernandez, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Now, uh, I'm going to share my screen. Welcome, Welcome everyone. everyone. Thanks, Thanks for having me. There's, There's a little, little delay, delay, but let's see if I can share, share my screen, screen here. here. All right, can you see that? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. All, All right, right, so I'll, I'll just jump, jump in. in. Yes. Okay. All, All right, right, so, so uh, again, my name is Stephen Hernandez. I'm with the Fair Political Practices Commission. Um, the uh, Fair Political Practices Commission, just to start off, uh, was created in 1974 uh, when voters passed Proposition 9, uh, which is known today as the Political Reform Act. And the Political Reform Act regulates conflicts of interest, campaign finance, and lobbying activity. Uh, the FPPC was created, the Fair Political Practices Commission was created to implement and enforce the act uh, and to inform and assist candidates and public officials in complying with these laws. Uh, so what we'll cover today, uh, I'm limited to an hour, so we'll try to keep it within there. Um, this presentation is structured just as a getting, getting started, so it's very minimal. We do offer other presentations that are a little bit more in depth. Um, but today what we'll cover is candidate committee forums, the committee ID numbers, record keeping, candidate and treasurer responsibilities, banking and fundraising, filing schedules, advertisements, and resources. Uh, feel free if you have questions. Um, I can't really see you, so um, if you have any questions, if someone could just jump in and let me know. Um, Please keep any questions to the content that's been covered. Um, as we, we may cover um, some, some information you're, you're wondering about later in the presentation, um, and then I'll address any questions towards the end as well. Um, but what the forms we're going to go over today is your candidate intention statement. Uh, that's the fi form 501. The statement of economic interest. That's the form 700, and then the form 410. That's your statement of organization. Um, everyone should have a copy of the presentation or have access to it. So you can always use these slides as references um, when going through your uh, committee process. So the first thing you'll file as a candidate is your candidate intention statement. Um, this is an example of the 501 here on the screen. You're going to file this uh, 501 before receiving or spending any money. That includes your personal funds. So before you receive or spend any money on your campaign, running for office, you're going to have to have a 501 on file. The 501, um, you're going to file for each election, even if you're running for re-election, and it's filed with your local filing officer, so whoever takes in your campaign statement forms. Here's an example. So this is, a, uh, this is the form itself. It's very simple. You're just going to put the candidate information here, so your information. If you're running for state office, then you'll, you will no, uh, notate something here in section two. If you're not running for a state office, then you do not fill out anything in section two at all. You don't check any box. You do not check the box for I do not accept. You just leave section two blank if you're running for a local office. Uh, and then just make sure you sign and date the form. You'll also be required to fill out your candidate uh, uh, Form 700, uh, this is the Statement of Economic Interest, again known as the Form 700. All candidates for elective office are going to file this. This is due by the Declaration of Candidacy, which will be determined by your jurisdiction. Uh, this is a public document, just like all your other campaign statements will be, so just be aware of what you're disclosing. You're not going to want to put any financial documents along with this. You're just going to fill out the form as is. Uh, we do offer workshops on how to complete this form, but for this presentation, just generally an overview. Uh, here's the cover page. You're going to put your um, your name here. Uh, if you're running for office right here at the top, you're going to put your information for your office that you're seeking here. The jurisdiction, you'll need to know your jurisdictional boundaries. You're going to put that here in section two, notate that in section two. 
Number three is the type of statement, section three. Again, you're doing a candidate statement. If you are elected into office, then you will have to do an assuming office statement once uh, you've assumed office. Um, but as candidates, you're going to do the candidate statement and your filing officer will probably let you know if you're gonna have to do the assuming office. Um, schedule uh, Section four is a, just a summary of all the schedules that you did fill out. So the form 700 asks um, about investment real property, income, gifts, travel payments. If you are running for office and you have questions about the Form 700, then um, outside of this presentation, I would say give us a call. Um, review the document, the Form 700. The instructions are listed in there on how to fill out each schedule. And again, the schedules are just uh, investments, real property, gifts, loans, stuff like that. Um, and then just sign and date. Uh, the bottom of the form. Again, that's public record and would be due at the Declaration of Candidacy. Are there any questions on those two forms before I jump onto the Form 410? Okay, I can't hear uh, any uh, questions, questions, so. No questions. No okay. questions, okay. So, so form, form 410, um, this is the form that you're gonna fill out to get your committee ID number, also known as the FPPC number. Uh, the form 410, when you first fill this out, you're gonna check the box for initial, and if you have not met a $2,000 threshold, either spending or raising $2,000, you're gonna check the box for not yet qualified. Most people who are starting out their campaign have not raised or spent $2,000. So we'll check the initial box and check not yet qualified. You do become qualified once you've raised or spent $2,000 from your campaign account. At that point, you will file an amendment. So you'll file a new form 410 with the amendment, uh, an amendment listing the day you hit that threshold, that $2,000 threshold. Okay, that's jumping ahead a little bit. But for now, what you're gonna do is running for office and you wanna get your committee ID number, you're gonna check the box for initial and check the box for not yet qualified. In section one, you're gonna complete your committee information. The committee name has specific requirements. So you need to thoroughly read the instructions for the naming requirements for your type of committee. If you have any questions on that, you can call or email the FPPC and we can uh, work you through it. But basically the minimum requirement for the naming of your committee has to be, uh, your last name has to be included, the office you are seeking, and the year of election. Those are the minimum requirements for naming your committee. Any committee name that does not have those three minimum requirements, the Secretary of State's office, they're the ones who receive and process these forms, will reject your form and ask you to fill out another one. The forms take about seven to 10 business days to process. So if your form is rejected, you're gonna have to wait again for the next seven to 10 business days. So it's important for you to read the instructions thoroughly. Um, we don't necessarily review the forms with you before you submit them over to the Secretary of State's office. The FPPC doesn't do that. But if you have specific questions about the form, we can address those. So if you call us or email in and say, hey, is this name, um, I've read the guidelines, you know, does this naming requirement count? Um, you can ask those type of questions. However, as long as you've read the guidelines, you're probably okay. Um, so committee information, just make sure you list everything here. Email addresses, I believe, are now required. Um, yeah, so required here, so make sure you list that as well. You are required to have at minimum a treasurer. You do not need to have principal officers. However, you can. So a treasurer does have to be listed on the minimum when filling out the form 410. You can be your own treasurer. So maybe you don't have a treasurer just yet, but you're looking for one, but you wanna get your committee ID number. You can list yourself as the treasurer. Just put your information in the treasurer section. And then once you do find a treasurer, you can send an amendment in, check the box for amendment. You wouldn't fill out date qualification threshold met if you haven't met that yet. And then just update the treasurer with the new treasurer information. In section three, uh, just be sure that the treasurer and the candidate both sign the form 410. 
The Secretary of State's office does allow electronic signatures. However, you'll follow their guidelines found on their website. This is page two of the Form 410. As a candidate, this is, there's three pages to the Form 410. As a candidate, you're just completing pages one and two. You will not need page three. Page two, if we go from the top, you're gonna put the committee name. And this is, uh, this top section here is asking for your banking uh, information. Now, when you are uh, setting up your bank account, the banking institution may ask for a committee ID number. Now the committee ID number, right, you wouldn't have it until you file the Form 410. So what you're gonna do on the Form 410, since you don't have your banking inf information yet, you're just gonna put pending here. That's gonna notate to the Secretary of State's office that you're in the process of receiving your banking information, but you need the committee ID number first. Once you've received your banking information, you're going to submit an amendment. So you're gonna check the box for amendment. Remember, we're gonna leave this blank. And then you're going to update your banking information and submit it uh, another one, okay? So you all have multiple amended forms that you need to submit if you're trying to get your committee ID number before um, uh, having all this information available to you. Next is type of committee. This is a controlled committee. A candidate will always be a controlled committee, so you will only need to fill out this section. You are not a primarily formed committee, so you won't need to fill out this section. You are not any of the types of committee on page three, so that's why you don't need page three. As a candidate, you are only filling out the section for controlled committee. That's the type of committee you are. So put your, your name, your uh, office sought, and then the year of election, and then you can check one or the other here. Okay, so the Form 410 is the one we get most questions on. Are there any questions on the Form 410 or receiving your, or filling out this form and getting a committee ID number? I'm gonna go into bank accounts and some other things here in a second. Yes. No questions? Okay. All right, so uh, some information on the committee ID number. So the committee ID number is used on all FPPC forms. The Secretary of State's office, again, is the one who assigns these committee ID numbers on a, once they've approved and processed a uh, completed Form 410. Those committee ID numbers are posted on the Secretary of State's website once they've been approved. And access to the link is here. So you can click that, it'll lead you to this blue and gold page. In the top left-hand corner, you can search for your committee. Now, I suggest that you be vague when you're searching for your committee because as people input information, it can, uh, spacing may be off or um, a comma may be input when one wasn't there or something. So it could throw the system off. So typically what I'll say, if you're looking for your specific committee, because your naming, the naming of your committee requires your last name and the year of election, that you start there. So start with your last name and the year of election and see what pops up. If you don't find your committee on the Secretary of State's website, then it probably has not been processed or there may have been an error with your filing. So you should reach out to the Secretary of State's office. Uh, note, if your bank requires a tax ID, taxpayer ID, you contact the IRS. So let me see if banking's here. Okay. so. Banking. Now, as a, as a candidate running for office, your campaign committee can only have one bank account per campaign. So you're going to, we don't regulate where the bank's from. It does have to be a California bank, but um, you know, we do encourage you to shop around while some banks have different rules for you opening a campaign account with them. Now, you don't have to open specifically a campaign account. You can open a personal account, a business account. We don't regulate the style of account. You just have to have a designated account. So just be aware that if you're going to the bank, the banks may require you to open a campaign account, which may require a tax ID number. For that tax ID number, you will contact the IRS. You may want to open a personal account. Sometimes I'll offer these suggestions to smaller communities. Um, just be aware if you do open a personal account uh, that people that are writing check donations to you may not want to write it to a personal account, may want something more official. Um, so I think that 
you may work in smaller communities, but just know your, your communities before setting up your account. It may help in the long run. There are no commingling of funds. So all campaign expenses need to go in and out. Uh, expenditures need to go in and out of your campaign account. All donations go in and out of that campaign account. Um, no personal funds can be used from that bank account. You can put personal funds into your campaign account. That is okay. Keep note as if, uh, if you're loaning those funds to your campaign or if you're donating those funds to your campaign. Um, and you'll notate those on the Form 460. Uh, again, candidates must make all campaign expenditures from the account and any monetary contributions received from others um, must be put into that designated campaign account. Campaign accounts continued. The committee uh, may not accept any cash contributions of $100 or more. So um, those would need to be done via check or electronic. Um, there are no anonymous or contributions of $100 or more. You can, that's prohibited. So no cash, no anonymous contributions, I'm sorry, um, of $100 or more. If a committee does receive a cash contribution of $100 or more from an unknown source, then that must be sent to the Secretary of State for deposit to the general fund. Uh, similarly, uh, contributions of $100 or more made by money order, cashier checks, established checks are prohibited and must be sent over to Secretary of State's office. Out-of-pocket expenses. So candidates, again, may not make out-of-pocket expenses. You can't use your own funds. You can use those funds if you deposit the personal funds into your campaign bank account. That is allowed, but you cannot use your own personal debit card to make campaign expenditures and then reimburse yourself. No, that's not allowed. You have to move those personal funds into your campaign bank account first. Others can make payments for it, can buy things for you, and you can reimburse them from the campaign account. But you, or I believe also your spouse can't, um, I have to double check that, but you uh, as a candidate cannot make any uh, personal expenditures from your personal account for campaign reasons. Um, candidates may only pay uh, filing fees, dial statement fees, and the $50 annual committee fee out of pocket. So your filing fees are going to come up. Those you can pay out of pocket. Ballot statement fees, those you can pay out of your personal pocket, right, because you may not have a committee set up yet. And those are the only options you have for paying out of pocket. Um, and then again, the $50 annual committee fee. So when you file the Form 410 and you become a qualified committee, you have a $50 filing fee for the year um, that your committee is active each year. Campaign workers, volunteers, even candidate spouses may make out. Okay, so yeah, the spouse can make out of pocket, out of pocket expenditures. I knew it was something like that. Campaign workers, volunteers, and even a candidate spouse may make out of pocket expenditures and be reimbursed, but the candidate themselves cannot. Um, a spouse of a candidate for elective office that though may not receive, in exchange for any services rendered, compensation from the funds held in the campaign account. So you can't pay your spouse or a registered partner to uh, be your treasurer. Okay. Record keeping. So you as a committee, you are required to record your contributions. You're going to record the names and addresses of contributors of $25 or more. And any contributors or contributions of $100 or more, you will also need to include, in addition to the names and addresses, the occupation and employer of that individual or the individual. Candidates and committees must keep all records and they, those would include any original source documentation such as bank statements and other records reflecting account activity, copies of completed campaign statements, and you're gonna keep those for a period of four, year, four years from the date the campaign statement uh, relating to the records was filed, okay? Be aware that candidate and treasurer are going to share responsibilities. Um, so if one gets in trouble, they both get in trouble, or if they're both not in trouble, they're both not in trouble, or if one's not in trouble, they're both not in trouble. So just be aware who your treasurer is. Um, before a candidate or committee may receive contributions, a treasurer must be appointed. So again, you can be your own treasurer, um, but before you can receive any funds, 
we have to have that um, pinpointed down. Both the candidate and treasurer must take appropriate steps to ensure compliance with reporting and record keeping rules. We do have a campaign disclosure manual um, on our website for local offices, that would be campaign disclosure manual two. For uh, state offices, that'd be campaign disclosure manual one. So you can research the chapters on reporting and record keeping in your appropriate manual. Um, just be sure you stay informed. Be aware of bank deposits and proper expenditures of campaign accounts. Um, at the end of your campaign, should you terminate, you're going to have to have your campaign bank account balance to zero. Just so to prevent any hiccups at the end, just make sure you're aware of everything going in and out of your account and it's properly notated. Um, in the event of an audit or investigation, both, again, the candidate and treasurer are equally liable. And some of the most frequent things that they're liable for are non-disclosure of campaign reports or lack of records. So just make sure you know your filings uh, are being filed. So we have the enforcement division, the FPPC enforcement division. What they do is they'll, um, anyone who suspects uh, a violation of the act should make a complaint with the enforcement division and then they'll proactively investigate um, should they find that there's something to investigate. Uh, they, we also have an audit program. So the act requires that the FPPC conducts uh, mandatory audits. Um, all candidates for statewide office, Supreme Court, Court of Appeals, and Board of Equalization are subject to audit if they have raised or spent $25,000 or more. Uh, and included in each audit are campaign statements filed by all candidates for elective office from statewide offices to local districts. It's also important to know your jurisdiction. So what's next for your committee? Um, campaign reports. So once you have done the 501 and you've completed your form 410, then what do you do? Um, you're going to have additional campaign reports to file. Those can be found in what's called a filing schedule. And you'll look at those filing schedules for filing deadlines. And I'll tell you which forms to fill out as well. I believe we may have an example in this presentation. Um, committee fundraising. So just fundraising. So be aware of contribution rules for monetary and non-monetary contributions. Uh, we already covered what kinds of contributions. So any $25 or more, you're going to have to have the name and address of that contributor. At $100 or more, you're going to also need to have their occupation and employer. Um, be, I, we do suggest that you record all contributions. That is because it's in the aggregate. So if somebody gave you $50 while you're only required to record their name and address at that point. If that same individual gave you $50 the following week, now their aggregate's at $100. Now you're required to have their occupation and employer. You may not necessarily notice that at the point of um, the donation, so you would need to follow up. Um, so just be aware, it may be just best, to, best practice, depending on your committee and your community, to rec record all information. And there are restrictions on uh, fundra uh, fundraising, so just be aware of um, any restrictions that you may have. I will always say refer to the manual first, um, but on the most part, uh, uh, you're good to uh, continue to raise money with uh, having the 410 and the 501 file and your bank account. Advertising disclosures. So as mentioned before, there is a chart for advertising. There are specific requirements depending on the type of advertising you're doing. And then there are resources available. So once you file the form 410 and you've qualified as a, and you've hit that $2,000 threshold, either in spending or in donations, contributions, um, you're gonna have to file the form 410. I'm sorry, the form 460. This is your campaign statement. Here's a preview of the cover page. You're gonna put the statement covers period. These period timeframes are notated on the filing schedule. The date of election. So if you're filing an election um, uh, year, then you're gonna put the election date here. The type of statement you're gonna file is listed here. Section one, you're an, a candidate or office holder. You're gonna check that box and that's it. You're good there. Section two will be type of statement. The filing schedule will tell you what type of statement you're filing. Most likely, you're, you're gonna when the election starts happening, you're going to be doing pre-election statements, 
and then uh, twice a year you'll file a semi-annual statement. But once the uh, election starts going, it'll be pre-election statements. The committee information, treasurer information here is going to be the exact same that you put on your Form 410. And just like the Form 410, the treasurer and the candidate are going to sign. This is a snapshot of what the various schedules throughout the Form 460 um, do. So on the Form 460, you're going to have to list contributions. You're going to have to list any loans received. You're going to have to list any non-monetary contributions. You're going to have to list any miscellaneous increases to cash as well as notate your loan repayments, any expenditures, any accrued expended expenses. You may not have to fill out every single schedule, but every schedule has its reasons for being in there. The ones for notating the money into your bank account are gonna be schedules A, B, C, and I. Those coming out of your bank account are gonna be notated in B, E, F. Most candidates are going to just use schedule A, B, and E, and C. A, B, C, and E are typically the and uh, are the, the most used scheduled. If you have any questions about filling out your Form 460, you can always call or email us. This is an example of a filing schedule. There are various filing schedules, so you'll need to be sure that you're looking at the correct filing schedule. This filing schedule is for candidates and controlled committees for local office. If you're running for state office, you're going to make sure you pull the candidate schedule for state offices. They may be similar, but there are some nuances, so just be aware of the schedule you're looking at. This schedule shows, this is for the November 7th, 2023 election, if there was one or someone having one. Then their semi-annual, right, would be due on July 31st. For the period covered, this asterisk is just pointing out when they started their committee, through June 30th. So what they would put here on their form, say they started their committee January 1st, 2023, then that's when they would put here through 630, 2023, because that's the period end date here. You do the same thing for pre-election. So it's due on the 28th, but you're reporting between the uh, time frame of January, July 1 through 923. So uh, July 1 through 923, is that what the date? Yeah, would be listed here. Type of statement, this is a pre-election statement, right? Because it says pre-election right here, or it says semi-annual. Okay, so this, this schedule is gonna tell you, and then it's gonna tell you what form you're gonna fill out. Okay, so you refer to this for your deadlines and your time periods and which forms you need to complete. Campaign contributions, so there are monetary and non-monetary contributions. Contributions are money, such as cash check, credit cards, or non-monetary items. So anything donated to you, if somebody donates campaign signs to you, that's a non-monetary contribution. There's a value there that has to be notated in your form for 60 um, that you received this non-monetary item at this at a particular value. Um, a contribution can also be coordinated payments by third parties, loans, or enforceable promises. Um, a non-monetary non, non contribution is received on the earlier of the following. So um, the date funds were expended by the contributor for the goods or services, and the date the candidate or committee or an agent of the committee obtained possession or control of the goods, or the date the candidate or committee received the benefit of the expenditure. So you're going to have to notate on the Form 460 when you receive this non-monetary contribution, say somebody gave you campaign signs or somebody created a website for you, the day that uh, of the earliest of these followings of these three listed here is going to be the date you're going to list for that non-monetary contribution. There are some campaign restrictions. So this is just really reiterating that there are no contributions of $25 or more without the contributor's name. It's just a way of saying, get the name and the address of somebody with $25 or more. Same thing, um, no contributions of $100 or more. Uh, in cash money order or traveler's checks. There are no contributions from foreign government or principal. However, permanent green card holding residents can contribute to the campaign. Okay, contribution rules. So receiving electronic contributions. So this is more common now. Um, you can receive contributions via credit card, wire transfer, debit account transaction, or more commonly used now, ACLU 
PayPal or Venmo or such text messages. The fees associated with these type of fundraisings um, or that are deducted by the various vendors that you're using, uh, you're going to not deduct them from the contribution from the person. So if an individual gives you $100, but Act Blue charges you $5, you're not going to notate on the form that you received $95 from the, from the contributor. You're still going to notate that you received $100 from that contributor, and that's going to be in Schedule A of the Form 460. That's your monetary contribution. You received $100 monetary contribution from them, but you as a committee had to pay that $5 fee. You're going to notate that $5 fee in Schedule E for expenditures. Okay, so when you receive these contributions electronically, just make sure that you're notating the full value of the contribution from the contributor in the Form 460, and then you'll notate the fees in a sec uh, separate section on the Form 460. Committee fundraising, so you can't have home and office fundraisers. There's an exception. Um, the home and office fundraiser only becomes a portable at a $500 threshold. All items donated to the event, not just occupation, I'm sorry, not just occupant or host contribution. So the event may only cost you $450. That doesn't make the event reportable. However, right, you're just still going to notate all contributions. But um, somebody brings over a $100 bottle of wine, now you're at $550 for the whole event. Now everything that you did, it becomes reportable outside of just contributions. If you have questions on that, just call us, email us. We can work that out with you. Um, fundraising example. Okay, so we have one here. Your committee holds a um, golf fundraiser and charges $200 per person. After the event, you determine that, the, that it costs your committee $50 per person to pay for the catering, the hall, rental, all that stuff. Uh, the invitations state that half of the ticket cost will be donated to a charity and half will be contributed to your committee. So on Schedule A of the Form 460, you're going to notate the $100 contribution from each ticket purchaser, as well as their name, address, occupation, and employer, but you're not going to subtract the per-person cost from each ticket sold. So the expenses, those expenses, similar to the um, credit cards, are going to be reported on Schedule E as an expenditure. So again, that's a lot for this presentation. Um, if you have questions about fundraising events, um, you can always call or email us. Uh, and you also should have the presentation for reference. So just quickly on the advertising disclosures, this is an example of the chart that was mentioned earlier. This is a snapshot of the one for communication. This is uh, advertising disclosure chart one. Um, there are various uh, disclosure charts. So you're going to want to make sure you're looking at the one for your particular committee. This is for communications by candidate committees for their own election. So make sure you're looking at chart number one. And this will tell you this type of the communication style. So the example we're looking at here is all mass mailings. It'll give a brief description and then tell you what the manner of disclosure is. So for example, here, all mass mailings need to have a six, no less than six point uh, type uh, and it be in a contrasting print or color. So those types of things will need to be followed if you're following these types of communication or sending out these types of communication. Uh, misconception, I think people hear all the time, unless your local or uh, unless your local jurisdiction has ordinance, but campaign signs are not required to have your committee ID number on them. However, it is recommended, but it is not legally required. So I like sustainability. So if you don't put your committee ID number on the campaign signs, you could reuse them. Um, however, depending on jurisdictions, you may have to open and close multiple committees, depending if your jurisdiction has local campaign contribution limits. Um, and if that's the case and you, ha and you have to get a new committee every time you run for office, you could be burning through signs every election cycle because you could put a committee ID number on there and uh, you may have to get a new committee ID number every election cycle. So it may be beneficial to you to not have the committee ID number on there. If you're for sustainability, it would help. Um, but just be aware, you do you. Um, but just know that the committee ID numbers are not required to be on the, on the campaign, on the yard signs, but they are recommended. 
you can find these advertising disclosure charts on our website um, just by going to learn tab campaign rules and then looking for campaign advertising requirements and restrictions and I know there's a link in the previous presentation as well this is our website so here's a link to our website uh, here's learn up here and then you would go to campaign rules campaign rules brings you to this page where we have all this information here. You can find your filing schedules under this section here, when and where to file campaign statements. If you're running for state office, you can look at contribution limits and voluntary expenditure ceilings. The forms are listed here. The disclosure manuals are listed here. So again, as a local candidate, you're gonna look for campaign disclosure manual two, state candidates campaign disclosure manual one. All the various advertising disclosure charts are here. As a candidate, you will be chart one. Just be aware, um, that the charts are a summary of what's in the manuals. The manuals are more in depth. Um, so you can use both as tools. We have the candidate toolkit, which just brings you um, which is just more information about starting out as a candidate, um, any local ordinances, um, and then treasurers. So for treasurers that are just starting out, there are some basic rules there for you, what your responsibilities are. Um, and I believe we may have sent out a treasurer guidebook um, for this presentation as well. Um, so here's the candidate toolkit. So just getting started, some campaign reports, um, communications, what to do after the election. So these types of things you'll find in here. This is the getting started tab um, here. This is what you would find here. So here's the forms we covered today. So you can find those forms here. And we also have video tutorials on the website as well. All right, so that's it from my uh, my half here. Um, our home home page is here. Um, if you have any questions, you can always email us. Uh, my preference is that you do some research first, and if there's some guidance you need on any of the information you've read, then reference that in an email, and we can clarify something there for you. Um, you can always call as well. We have open phone lines Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Um, to assist. And we do provide uh, extended phone hours during campaign deadlines um, for like for the week prior or the week of. So we'll, we are there to assist you if you have any questions. Just be aware that the filing officers are just there to receive your forms and any detailed questions. I mean, they can help you with their jurisdictions and, you know, they do more than just receive forms but they, um, any detailed questions about filling out the form should be directed to the FPPC. Um, so we can make sure you stay in compliance with our laws. Um, and then uh, any questions or if we wanna wait to the end, I'm open for either. Go ahead. Do, do you, you wanna come? Uh... Yeah, we'll okay. So Steven, the question is about searing now your account. Do you remember when you mentioned that earlier? Say that again. When you zero out your account. Yes, uh-huh. Can you repeat that part? Yeah, yeah so, so uh, you're, you're just gonna, gonna that, that was talking about terminating your, your committee. So, so at, at the, the point, point of say the campaign's all done and over with, with you're, you're not gonna rerun, you're, you, you don't, don't need your open committee, committee and you, you don't, don't need, need the committee, committee anymore. anymore. One of the requirements for terminating your committee is that you zero out your campaign bank account. So uh, we find sometimes that people after having their committee open for X amount of years, at the end, say my can't balance my, my form. I can't get my stuff to balance. Well, we don't review the forms for you. You're gonna have to go in and find the error. So best practice is just to make sure that you're staying consistent and up to date with your your campaign bank accounts ins and outs um, but, but when, when i was mentioning zeroing out it was just when you're terminating your committee by zeroing out meaning there has to be no balance left correct correct, correct. Yes. yes no, no money, money left in the account so zero balance on your in your campaign bank account do we have any other questions from the audience all right steven it looks like we do not have any more questions so thank you for providing this presentation yeah. I'll, I'll stay, stay until, until we're all done. And so I want to thank you, Stephen, uh, especially from Hernandez from the political 
uh, at PPC for joining us today. I know that was a lot of information and I'm sure anybody that's thinking of running for office or who has run for office knows that the process of filing and maintaining your committee is quite extensive and sometimes it can be a little bit complicated. We do have people in our elections office that are able and willing to help you. Uh, we have gone through this process a couple times so we can provide some guidance. However, the experts are the FAPC and for any further questions, we do recommend you reach out to them. But at this time, if nobody else, does anybody else have a question about any of the subjects that we talked here today? If the answer is no, we're gonna go ahead and close today's candidate forum. I wanna once again thank everyone who participated today, all the presenters and also all the attendees. And like you mentioned before, this will be published and put on our website, uh, various social media platforms, and it will be shared on YouTube as well. So thank you.